Welcome to John Redmond, Power of Attorney, the show that aims to empower you through knowledge of the law. I'm attorney John Redmond. And hello everyone, I'm Shauna Sanford. Well, now that a key portion of the Voting Rights Act has been struck down, what will the fallout be? The five to four ruling by the Supreme Court justices means that Louisiana and several other southern states no longer have to get federal approval before making any changes to the state voting laws, John. Today we have two excellent guests to talk about the issues before Louisiana and the country as everyone tries to better understand what sort of impact the ruling will have on voters across the nation, state, and the state representatives, Wesley Bishop and a, de a Democrat of New Orleans and Kevin Pearson, a Republican from Slidell, will join us in just a few moments. Plus, we'll have comments from Secretary of State Tom Shedler. That's right. And before we bring our guests on, John, I know that uh, the rights of minorities are very, very important to you. And I want to know, what is your take on the ruling? Well, it was a shock. I really, um, no one... I'm sure some people expected it. Those people who appealed all the way to the U.S. Supreme Court uh, were hoping for such a ruling. But what it does, according to the critics, is it um, takes the crown jewel out of the Voting Rights Act. The Voting Rights Act was put in place to uh, protect the uh, rights of people who, over the decades, uh, they argued, were being prevented from uh, exercising their right to vote fully. And uh, today the critics are saying that we're taking a big step backwards. And uh, it's going to be a very interesting discussion because proponents say this, this is long overdue. The government intrusion, the bureaucratic headaches and expense uh, is far um, too great compared to the little benefit that might still be coming out of it. Yeah, well, our guests are anxiously awaiting to talk about this, and uh, we want to hear what they have to say. So I'm coming up next, we will speak with our guests today. So stay tuned, and we'll be right back. This new phone is awesome. It has made my life so much easier. You know, I get kind of bored when I'm driving and I need to know what's going on. So now, with this huge screen, a keyboard, and a ton of apps, I can get a text and write back right away, no problem. It's like I barely even have to look at it. The law was put in place in 1965, and Louisiana deserved to be in it, quite frankly. I mean, Louisiana has a checkered political past, and certainly in this area of law, we all have to admit, shamefully so, that these things occur. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to the show. You just heard Secretary of State Tom Shedler talking about the decision concerning the Voting Rights Act, which was a very big story that emerged last week from the United States Supreme Court. And today, we are excited to have two guests on Power of Attorney to help us delve deeper into the Voting Rights Act and what this could mean for all of us. Our guests today are two men who are on the front lines of creating and voting on new laws for Louisiana and redrawing of the state's voting lines. Uh, Representative Ed Wesley Bishop and Kevin Pearson. Gentlemen, it's a pleasure to have you on the show today. We look forward to having this discussion with you both. Thank Thanks you for having me. Thank you. It's great to have you here, and this is such a big topic. We're going to start big and then try to, to bring it on uh, in a little bit. So let's sort of start at the beginning uh, with the Voting Rights Act. And, John, you mentioned it at the very beginning. The crown jewel is considered of the civil rights movement. Major decision coming out of the U.S. Supreme Court concerning uh, the Voting Rights Act. Some people uh, are saying that it was overdue. Some people are saying that was that it was outrageous. So, gentlemen, let's get your take on it. And Representative Bishop, we'll start with you. Sure. Uh, I feel as if the action that was taken by the U.S. Supreme Court on last week was, in fact, outrageous. Uh, the crown jewel has been referred to many times. It will be referred to many times from this point forward. Of the civil rights movement was the idea that individuals or relative states had to pass preclearance if they were shown to have an egregious pass. And what's unfortunate about Louisiana happens to be a part of those states that were viewed to be uh, have had egregious past. As Secretary Shelley has already mentioned, particularly when you look throughout the southern states, your Louisiana, your Mississippi, Alabama, and, and uh, New Orleans for that matter, were in fact a part of this egregious past. So when you have what most folks have now, the teeth being taken out of the Civil Rights Act, uh, I think it's unfortunate. Uh, this voter's right legislation was a very 
important part of what it is that we're trying to get done. And now we're in a situation whereby many folks, particularly in the civil rights community, uh, and for those who seek to provide fairness and opportunity to anyone here in the United States, are really concerned and are facing some real challenges with this legislation and with this particular bad bill that was in fact passed. Representative yes. Pearson, your take on it. Well, I, I think uh, Chief Justice Roberts said at one point that history didn't stop. You know, it didn't stop in 1965. And I think in Louisiana, it's been evidence that we have done tremendous things far and above what other states have done as far as uh, coming up. And I just don't know if we can continue living in the past such as that. And it's not the Supreme Court's job to create laws, to write laws. It's to interpret the Constitution and to rule. And I think when the Supreme Court looked at it and said, we're still using these uh, these uh, issues based upon the last, you know, going back to 1965, we're, we're far different. I think one of the statistics, in 1965, 80% of white registered voters and 31.5% black, okay? No question that there was a problem there. But if we look today, in 2000, well, going back to 2004, 75.1% were white, 71% were African American. I mean, we've made tremendous strides in the state, and I think Louisiana could be a model that other states should adhere to. Yeah, well, I don't know that people are saying we haven't made strides, but mm -hmm. people are saying there haven't been enough strides, that there's still so much more to go, um, and certainly racism still does exist. That we cannot deny either, mm -hmm. but there's still so much more progress to be made. What do you say to that argument? The progress, I think, that needs to be made in a lot of cases may be in other states across the country. Mm. Um, if you look at Massachusetts, I mean, uh, you know, Massachusetts is a state that I think the justices singled out saying that there was a large percentage difference between the white and the African American voting. Um, I need an example of how long should this go on? Let In other give, words, let me give you an example. Yes. Here. Let me help you with this. Okay. You have a situation, and, and I absolutely agree. You have a situation whereby, in the state of Louisiana, we're both Louisiana state representatives, I would be the first to admit there are mm -hmm. tremendous strides that, in fact, have been made. But part of the reason I think some of those strides were, in fact, made is because we had a United States Supreme Court. We had a Department of Justice whose job it was to oversee or to play as big brother to see exactly what, in fact, was going on. We still on. do. Well, when we take a look, though, you gave us some stats a second ago. Let me give you a few other stats. As we speak, in our very own House of Representatives in Louisiana legislation. You have a situation whereby there are many attempts to, in a different format than we had in 1965 and 1975, but in an attempt to try to uh, suppress the voters all the same. The same stats that I'm looking at say that there are 41 states as we speak mm -hmm. since 19, 2011 that have filed voter suppression laws mm -hmm. currently on their books. Some are successful, some are not successful. But I think what that does, that speaks to the idea that many people feel as if the way in which you win elections isn't just to go out to champion and see who has the best but, interest. But hear me for a second. Yeah. What some <laughs> folks would suggest is that what we need to do, if we can control who votes and the manner in which they vote, oftentimes we can determine the outcome. I just don't see the suppression in Louisiana and, and the 41 cases mm -hmm. that you're mentioning, referring to, are those all of the nine states that are in, that were within the Voters' Rights Act, or have you looked outside of that and the other states that are well, not included within well, it? Well, those were the states that were determined that need to have preclearance prior to moving forward. Of so course, is you know, Louisiana mm -hmm. is one of those states. Mm -hmm. And gentlemen, let's just take a step back because a lot of our viewers, they may not be uh, nearly as well versed. I know they're not nearly as well versed as you, gentlemen. Who could, you spend your 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 working lives in the legislature addressing laws, fighting for the causes. The Voting Rights Act in question was one that said, if you want to pass a law that has to do with setting the hours of the voting rights, uh, uh, if you want to determine what is going to be a voting district, if you want to pass any laws that have to do with that may affect the rights of voters all voters, then the Department of Justice has got to oversee it or double check mm -hmm. that it's not going to disproportionately affect mm -hmm. the rights of any voters. And it could be something as And simple. that's the law that sure. was in place, sure. especially in the early days, mm -hmm. in 65, uh, that is the civil rights early days, mm -hmm. uh, and certain, everybody agrees early on it was needed and yes. it had great value and effect. The Supreme Court has said, well now things have changed. The African American population in the United States and in those those mm -hmm. states singled out has gotten a much more powerful political voice. They are able to uh, uh, fend for themselves. They're not being prevented from getting to the polls like they were back then. Mm -hmm. And the disagreement is 
um, uh, Representative Bishop, you're saying it's still not enough. There's still voter suppression that needs the Department of Justice oversight. And you're saying, really, it's not there anymore. There are so many examples where uh, the, these, these states are, the, the voters are not being suppressed and they're able to stand up to attempts to suppress them. Is that a it's fair restatement? Going, it's all going back on the data from 1965. You're saying what the Supreme Court looked at, what they said, this law needs to be struck down because it relied on outdated data? Absolutely. In fact, Justice Roberts said that it is outdated and unreasonable, yes. right? What do you say to that? Well, I would say that it goes to the dissent that Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg mentioned, in that she mentioned how, one, there is, in fact, a definite need to have supervision over this entire process. This isn't the easiest conversation to have. Let's, let's be very candid mm -hmm. about this entire piece mm -hmm. here. It's hard to have a conversation that even borders on race, let alone centers on race. But the whole premise of the Voting Rights Act was to undo some of the things that was embedded in this particular country. So although we're here in the year 2013 and we're looking back at the year 1965, the reality is that we have some very real concerns. So old data is better than no data at all? Is that now, we don't have to go through old data, John. When, when I cite two, a 2011 study that just came out not too long ago that talks about the issues that we're still having here in the year 2013, that's real, that's relevant, and that's ready day data right now. And the committee that renovates the law or reuses the law or, or reauthorizes the law, they last reauthorized the law in 2006, they look at this, uh, they look at the studies. The study I'm speaking of came out in 2011, so right. they couldn't refer back to Obviously that. Obviously And Congress yes. can come with a new law based on new data. But you're assuming that Congress can get together and agree on a new law. That's kind of a big assumption. Well, first assumption, of all, I mean, do you well, even expect I, I that mean, Congress will take the this number, up? Look at the number of congressmen who passed this, the extension of 25 years. In 1965? Right, in 2006. No, the extension in 2006. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, it was a very large number. I think 30, there were 30 that opposed it. So to say that they can't go and, and deal with this, I don't know. I have a little bit of confidence that maybe they can deal with it. If there are cases where there is voter suppression, I would expect Congress to deal with that, but not simply to go back and say, you did it in 1965, therefore, you were the one subject to pre -clearance. Starting from scratch, you think they could get together and get a bipartisan bill through? I would hope they could get something. I don't think what they do you could. Think? I don't think that they could. And let's go back to Louisiana. I've been in the State House two and a half years. My first session there, a bill, in fact, was passed to shorten the number of hours someone could use to actually go and vote. <laughs> now, Is that a good, bad bill? Well, I, I think it was a bad bill. I opposed the bill. Why? Most folks that I work with oppose the bill. Because I think any in the most democratic country on the face of the earth, why in the world should we be in the business of shortening the amount of time someone can actually vote? There weren't any real financial savings to the bill. So it causes me as a state lawmaker to take a look at it, and I'm also the vice chair of the Louisiana Legislative Black Caucus. Mm -hmm. So when I take a look at something, I'm looking at it for the benefit of those individuals who live in House District 99, but I'm also looking at it from the benefit of the African American population in the state of Louisiana. And when I look at those kind of bills, I can't help but wonder as to whether or not there are some individuals who who may use that as a mechanism to try and suppress the voters, not just in this state, but in this entire nation. And in because fact, here in Louisiana, voting hours have been restricted. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and I would say to that, the pollsters, those who are going to the polls, I mean, maybe we want to give them a little bit more or something, but waking up at 3 a.m. in the morning, you get the polls open for the early time. If, if what time is it? Is it 7 o'clock in the morning, 6 o'clock in the morning? 6 to 8. 6 mm -hmm. to 8. So if that's the case, why don't we push it and make it 24 hours? I mean, if, if that's the yeah, argument, but that's how the way can it's we been say for many decades, and it worked mm -hmm. pretty good, Fine. didn't it? There was no problem with it. Uh, well, six o'clock. If you've been in the polls to see how many people go to vote, uh, I've heard that there are very, very few that, that go from six to seven. Can be made from twelve to one but at lunch, not, from five to six. You can an pick any one hour racism. time. Racism. That is, an, I mean, the whites no, and African Americans should, both. Let me let me ask this question. Statistically, mm -hmm. and I understand that this is this is an argument made by people who are able to figure these things out. Mm -hmm. Disproportionately, those people who go to vote from 6 to 7 a.m. are those blue-collar workers who have to get to the restaurants early in the morning, the hotels. Not, from what but disproportionately, it is the Democratic voters who are affected by this much more than Republican I'm going to let you address that. We have to take a break. I'm going to let you address that when we come back. Coming up next, we're going to take your questions and continue this great discussion. So stay tuned. We'll be right back. That one-on-one -on -one relationship with an adult is so important. 
if every day somebody is touching base with somebody and then they get to spend some time each week with that person, there's a relationship that develops and all the communities and school services are really designed to create that one-on-one -on -one relationship. This school has taught me so much to be the best that I can be. They never give up on me. They never give up on anyone here. Evidenced by President Obama's election, even for the second time, obviously he wasn't elected by just the black community. So that's wonderful. That, that, that tells us that, that there has, in this country, finally reached parity on that. I also bring you to this, 13, over 1,300 black elected officials in the state of Louisiana, as we speak today. I would venture to say in 1965, you, I don't know if you had any but probably single digits. I don't have that data. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the show there. You just heard Secretary of State Tom Shedler again talking about why he believes that the U.S. Supreme Court made the right decision concerning the Voting Rights Act. Now, every week on the show, we like to get our viewers involved in the conversation. And as you have seen, we are having quite a lively discussion here today with our guests on the ruling concerning the Voting Rights Act, Representative Wesley Bishop and also Representative Kevin Pearson. Try to say that three times fast. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you all so much for being here. We, we are having a great discussion. And there you just heard again, Secretary of State Tom Shedler making the case for why he believes the justices made the right decision. He says that we have now reached parity in voting in the United States as evidenced by the re-election of President Barack Obama, who was not solely elected by the African-American vote. Representative Pearson, what do you say to that? I mean, I think that's a, I mean, he, he does make a good point. The in the last election, I think the numbers that we have are 69 percent white, 67 percent African American voted in the election. I mean, I think that speaks pretty well about what we've done. I, I would challenge anyone to go look and compare that to any other state in the country and see who's done better. I think Louisiana has done a great job at that. And I think going forward, he, what sent, uh, Representative Bishop and I both, I think, will continue to look at these things. We may have disagreements on, like mm -hmm. we were talking about, the hours. I mean, the hours, uh, very few people are going in the public place early. Maybe we do. I mean, again, we did continue that as it was. But um, it's not for the reasons. The reasons I voted for that was not anything to do with that. It was to do with the very lack, the very few people who were actually were going to the polls at the early hours. And so just to be clear, so that we can bring everyone up to date, we were talking about the fact that here mm -hmm. in Louisiana, we have restricted voting, uh, mm -hmm. voting hours. Mm -hmm. um, it was, what, five to six? Six to eight. Six to eight. Mm -hmm. um, and you were in favor of that. Is that correct? Yes. yes. But 6 a.m. to 8 p.m. 6 a.m. to 8 p.m. I think to increase it one hour. In other words, to, to go from seven. To decrease it. To yeah. decrease it. Yes, to decrease it. Now, yes, decrease mm -hmm. of course, you were opposed to that. I, I, I was absolutely opposed to it. Uh, based upon, I'm usually against any any effort to decrease the opportunity that our citizens have to exercise the right to vote. Uh, and and what I think what's so interesting about it is that there's always a fine line that, that you try and uh, approach. Many of my colleagues, similar to Representative Pearson, made a decision based strictly upon whether or not it was a financial uh, benefit or whether or not they just didn't think that the the additional hour really meant a whole lot based upon the usage mm -hmm. in the past. Mm -hmm. And and. And I would believe my colleagues who tell me that they actually do that. But I'm also not naive, naive enough to believe that there aren't some individuals who chose to shrink that because of the idea that there are certain individuals who wouldn't go out and vote or wouldn't be allowed the opportunity to vote if they can vote during that particular time. Just case in point, uh, if we talk about a Saturday, a lot of individuals who I know, who I happen to represent in House District 99, go to work very early in the morning. So if they're not, if they can't go in and vote between 6 o'clock and 7 o'clock, they're required to be on the job at 7.30 and they don't get off until 7, chances are they're not going to need the opportunity to vote. Now, there may be a whole lot of individuals with that kind of work schedule in my district than in some other districts, but my job is to represent those 43,000 sure. individuals. But sure. let's not forget the early voting that we have in Louisiana, which is quite amazing. An entire week where someone can do that, can go in and vote. And I think there are cases when people can mail in ballots mm -hmm. if they need to under those circumstances. There's no excuse, there's no reason not to be able to vote. Yeah, most folks work during the day. Most right. folks work the same hours. Well, just so we're clear, Friday. early voting is during business hours hours on weekdays, correct? Mm -hmm. So it's hard for people, you know, I could take off during the business day, I'm fortunate that way, but a lot of other people can't tell the, their job where they work, hey boss, but I, I need to go vote. I think you have the opportunity to do a mail-in ballot if you needed to, or you also had an entire week 
in which you have the opportunity to vote. Yeah, and hopefully we can educate our voters better certainly. about that, and, and maybe we'll get that stuff certainly. on our show website. Sure. But the more we can educate the voters, the mm -hmm. more opportunity we give people to vote, mm -hmm. the better, because the more people participate in our democratic mm -hmm. voting system, the better. I think we've done better. a great job on Louisiana. But do you agree there's been a trend across the nation, and it seems that it's the Republican uh, legislators who are proposing the shortened hours and not Democrats. Is that a coincidence? It's true. He may say that, but I mean, it's not for it's the true. reasons that it's being portrayed. At least I've not heard that. This is the first time. <laughs> Actually, yes. For the, those who I, I, go this and, is what the critics tell me. Those so the, who go I'm, and man I'm going to hit you with some hard questions, too. <laughs> those who go and man the polls are waking okay. up at 3 a.m. in the morning. And it was and, and those we were, were the ones who were asking God bless for it. Those, let me tell you, God bless yes. those people yes. who work the polls. Those are volunteers. Yes. And I always go out of my way to thank them. Mm -hmm. and you do the same. And I want to get to our, vo our uh, viewer questions here. Um, we have a question that says, I've been asked to present my ID every time I've ever mm -hmm. voted. Um, was that legal? It was. Yeah, because here it in Louisiana, was. this yeah. is the thing. We've been, uh, we have to show our ID, and mm -hmm. we've been doing that for quite Sean, some time. I was, I was telling Kevin off air. Many of the, it's interesting that we're having this conversation here in Louisiana, because I, I, I must admit that many of the issues that other states are dealing with, we're actually on the front end of mm -hmm. some right things That's here in the true. state of Louisiana. Yes. That's true. But my, con my contention is that this issue goes far beyond the state of Louisiana. We look at our neighboring states like Mississippi and Alabama and Georgia and South Carolina, there's some very real concerns that are occurring. And so we can't just take the ad, ad, attitude that, well, here in Louisiana, we're moving forward, so we're now separate and apart from the other 49 other states that made the Voter Tribes Act important to pass in the first place. Yeah, and let's backtrack just a little bit because we've been talking about Section 5, Section 4. Um, explain to our viewers, Section 5 is the preclearance section. Mm -hmm. That is intact, but it's Section 4 that was struck down that essentially makes Section 5 move, right? What's, what Section 4 basically did was that it's determined a formula as to what would be used and determine which states had to actually go through plea clearance. And what they did was they looked at, I guess, past practices to see which states had the most egregious practices throughout from 1965 on back. And most of those states, as most of us know, were those states that were identified in the southern portion of the United States. You know, so that's Section 4 dealt with that formula, and Section 5 was the actual uh, pre-clearance authorization. Right, and so essentially what uh, the justices are saying is that you got to go back and, and rework the formula, mm -hmm. right? That's yes. essentially what and they're I, saying. And I think they should, again. I mean, looking at the number of registered voters in Louisiana compared to any other state, I think we've done a tremendous job in Louisiana. And I mean, that is one of the things. You're asking a question about the vo voting, uh, having to show your driver's license. I did want to add one thing. Yeah. And some people say, it's like, well, what if I lost my driver's license? What if it, yeah, what you do can do? simply go and just sign an affidavit at the polling place. They will ask you questions to identify yourself, something such as your mother's maiden name, your social security number. We're not trying to suppress any voters in Louisiana. That's good mm -hmm. to know. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Maybe you. Louisiana may not be trying to suppress any voters compared to some of our neighboring states, but I think when you look at this entire civil rights conversation, particularly as it relates to these 10 states that were determined to have to be, have plea clearance in the first place, I think the motive is still, in fact, out, and, 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 and the validity of what they're attempting to do, I think is in question by a lot of individuals. And even if you do suspect that there is discrimination of whatever kind when it comes to voting, you still can pursue a legal remedy. Correct. That, that's absolutely correct. But the reality is this. Most folks I know don't have the money to hire an attorney. Most folks I know who I live in my particular district, if they're in fact disenfranchised at the voting polls or in similar districts throughout the entire uh, United States of America or in these 10 states that we're speaking of, my district is very similar to those particular districts. So that's why I have to champion this particular but I think there are many organizations who are ready and willing to take up any of those causes if it is brought to their attention. Well, okay. and unfortunately, if they take up the Supreme Court, it may lose on a 5-4 verdict, just like this one just did. Okay, we have another question from a voter. It says, um, if Section 5 of the Voting Rights Act was reauthorized by Congress in 2006, which is exactly mm -hmm. what we were talking about um, a little earlier, why couldn't it be reauthorized now? So essentially what happens to that reauthorization? It's just now moot, right? I mean... I think so. The, the preclearance, in other words, the whole issue was a, the preclearance. In other words, any time, if we had a voter registration application in Louisiana, if we changed one word, if we misspelled address and, and put two S's on it or something like that happened, <laughs> we would actually have to go to the Department of Justice to get approval in order to have that. If we had a polling place that burned down, and we decided in Louisiana to move the, the polling place right across the street. Must go to the Department of Justice to be pre-cleared. It's those things, and it's costly to do that when you look at all the voting districts in the state. Any 
any change that you would make regarding any realm of voting must be cleared by the Department of Justice. Anything. Those are very specific examples that are absolutely true. But that didn't really get to the, the meat of the matter. The meat mm -hmm. of the matter is that oftentimes those particular changes, not specific to the ones that he's speaking of, but similar changes like that, were used as a ruse to deny individuals the right to vote. And that's why we're here in the, in the very beginning. And, and we don't have to disagree on that. We all know our history. And we yes. realize that, mm -hmm. what, what that. And so, what, and when you, when you have that kind of a history, I think you want to make sure that history never happens again. So, if it's a mistake, it's a mistake on the side of caution. You err on the side of caution, is what you're saying. I would agree. Okay. All right, gentlemen. Well, we have pretty much come to the end of a program. It has totally uh, flown by, but we really want to encourage our viewers out there to, to get to, to know as much about this as, as possible and to educate mm -hmm. themselves about the voting laws because um, education, as we say all the time, it is power. Knowledge is power and uh, folks do need to go out there and so very quickly is this going to affect voting line uh, voting lines here and how they're drawn or this is not an issue that you all are going to deal with for another eight not nine, for another years. yeah eight yeah, years eight, nine, uh, yeah. <laughs> so but I, I don't think so because I mean when we passed it in the legislature I mean I we passed it and it, it, was, it, was, it approved. was approved it was by approved. the DOJ yeah. I mean we're very cognizant it, of that. It, the plan we approved was an ideal because uh, there they were, they were several issues that actually came up, we, but it was in fact pre-cleared, and uh, so we move forward with that. Well, thank you both so much, Representative Very Kevin, Kevin Pearson you. and Wesley Bishop. We thank appreciate you. your time, and thank you all so much for uh, joining the program. I want to remind you, everyone, if you want more information about this program or others, visit the show online at johnredmondpoa.com to get more information. You can also watch every episode of this show on our website. Don't forget to like us on Facebook, follow us on Twitter, and to keep sending in your questions. Thank you so much. We will see you next time on John Redmond, Power of Attorney. Excellent, excellent show. Excellent.